J.K. Dobbins returns, Justin Tucker gets extended, a Tyler Linderbaum injury update, and so much more here to talk about on Locked on Ravens with a very special guest. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And we return here with another episode of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostreicher of Ravens Wire. We're here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Ravens your first listen of the day. We're free and available on all platforms. That includes on YouTube. And we're back on a very eventful Taco Tuesdays. We had a ton of news drop for the Ravens on Monday. Here to break it all down is our Taco Tuesday guest return to the show, Spencer Schultz of Baltimore Beatdown. Spencer, I mean... What what a day it was on Monday. I don't even know where to start here. We have a lot to talk about. How you doing? Doing fantastic. Ryan Mountcastle, Tony Santander going back to back as I'm sitting here as well. <laughs> J.K. Dobbins is back. Justin Tucker's extended. We got news on many fronts here. Kyle Hamilton having a fun day. So Baltimore's buzzing. There's going to be a game this Thursday. Football is officially back. We got hard knocks coming up tomorrow. It is football season. We are here. We have made it. So it's a, a fantastic day. The Orioles are hot. The Ravens are looking to stay quiet and start returning some forces. Couldn't be doing much better. Love, love, love it. Yeah, Baltimore sports are alive right now. Like, seriously, seriously alive. And, and, and it's amazing. And we had so much news happen for the Ravens on Monday, Spencer. I mean, let, let's start with Tyler Linderbaum, the injury update and then confirmation from, from John Harbaugh here. Now, Linderbaum got rolled up on on Thursday's practice last week, and John Harbaugh initially said, hey, you know, he's going to miss one to two weeks, you know, kind of see what happens, see what the recovery looks like. And then Mike Garofalo and Ian Rappaport of NFL Network on Monday report that there was a Liz Frank injury, which Linderbaum had dealt with in college a little bit. It was a sprain there, so it got a little iffy in terms of what the recovery could be. Like, those injuries are nothing to mess around with, but then John Harbaugh was asked about it, and he says – that's not true. You know, the, the prognosis is the same. The report that came out, that's not true. So we're just all over the place here, Spencer. I know I've said it. We're not doctors, although as John Harbaugh said, we might have to start playing them here on the show based on how much we talk about these injuries. Where, where are you at with this whole thing with Linderbaum? How long would you hold him out for maybe precautionary reasons or whatnot? Just what are your thoughts on that whole situation? Well, there's no reason not to be overly cautious. And the Ravens front office, the Ravens coaching staff usually – when something scorns them, they double down on it. Injuries scorned them last year, so they doubled down on it by switching up their practice schedule, by bringing in a new head athletic trainer, by taking many, many precautions and implementing a more a more rigorous uh, foolproof system, so to speak. Not foolproof necessarily, but just trying to attempt to make themselves in a – and put them in a better position to avoid those injuries ultimately. So with Linderbaum, had an issue back in on New Year's Day playing in the Citrus Bowl against the Kentucky Wildcats. He ended up coming out for a series, coming back in for the, the Hawkeyes' last series of that game. Apparently, he was previously dealing with that. Beyond that, Ian Rappaport and Mike Garofolo's words, uh, a little bit in question now because of Harbaugh's statement. But all that Harbaugh did was basically just cast a gray cloud over it. So uh, we're only left to you know make butts of ourselves by assuming. So ultimately... I don't know. Play it safe. You you just want them to play it safe. If your your rookie center isn't ready week one, I don't think that's the end of the world. Uh, Tyler Linderbaum definitely has a ton of potential. Can do some really awesome things. But and you, you want him on the field. You want him to get preseason reps. But pushing him through, making him play a couple series in the preseason ahead of time, all of these things when there have been some sort of lingering concerns, they're going to know better than us. Always, we'll always preface with that. But better be safe than sorry. Better keep him out. You know, you've got a guy in McCary that. It's a serviceable center. He's had some struggles at times, also played well there too. So if you need to trot him out week one, I don't know that there's some huge drop-off in the level of play you get week one. And you're also allowing Linderbaum to make sure he's in the best shape possible and that he's not going to have a lingering injury. So you're not immediately making yourself thin when you might not need to be. So if if it only needs to be a week, hey, you know we don't have any ability to, to factor in that decision, but I would prefer better safe than sorry. Yeah, and it is unfortunate because I think there are so many players on this team that can benefit from those preseason reps, those training camp reps. We kind of saw it with Rashad Bateman when he went out early in training camp last year, didn't get the preseason, you know, had to kind of lead up to his debut in kind of the early middle part of that year. But Linda Barber, I think, could have benefited. And obviously, we don't know. He could end up returning in a week or two, and that'll be that, and that's it. But, Spencer, I did want to ask about, you kind of prefaced it a little bit, the center position. 
without Linderbaum. If he has to miss extended time, if he's not available for the start of the year, you have McCarry, as you talked about, Tristan Cologne there as well. Do you think they would need to bring in somebody else? And what are you feeling about those two guys already on the roster? Well, it's tough to say they need to bring in someone else when you when you do have depth there. You do have someone who's started quite a few games. You have someone who started a little bit there, and Tristan Colon Castillo as well. So Colon Castillo, I believe, is in his third year in this system. McCarry, you know, extended for a reason to be that six man off of the bench to be able to go fill in as needed. So I don't know that they need to go bring someone else in. I'm sure there'll be rumblings of JC Treader somewhere on the old Twitter sphere or something like that. But you spent your capital on Linderbaum, so he is the long term plan. You have depth immediately. So uh, one of the better positions, you know, to, to have maybe a little bit of a hiccup there injury wise in terms of depth and what they have available. So at this point in time, you know, I just assume McCary is just going to slide on in as expected and, you know, not going to be able to spend time playing tackle, doing other things, but they say he can play all five for a reason. So at this point it's him and hopefully Linderbaum has a speedy recovery and then you regain that depth piece back again. Yeah, and speaking of depth, Spencer, I know we have talked at length about the cornerback position on the show, you and I, about how it seems like every year this Ravens team starts out with 50 million different corners. They end the year with two. And so far throughout training camp, there have been a couple of injuries at that position. You have Brandon Stevens missing some time, Arlen Humphrey missing a couple practices here as well. J.O. Number Davis was limited. So, Again, with Marcus Peters still on the man, you're looking at Kyle Fuller, Pepe Williams. And Fuller, you know, it seems like has had, I think, putting it nicely in up and down training camp. So you're kind of wondering what the plan is. The Ravens did sign Daryl Worley yesterday. They put Vince Beagle on injured reserve. What's your feeling about this cornerback position right now? Do you think they need to bring in even more bodies, even though they just brought in somebody? Well, they already tried to get a little proactive. They brought in Fuller and, you know, all, from all reports, doesn't sound like he's having the best camp, but can be indicative one way or the other. Someone who is on the back nine of his career, most certainly. Uh, yes, the, sh- the the short answer is yes, they do, because they can never have enough, no matter what they do, no, how much, no matter how many picks they spend, no matter how much money they spend. Year in and year out, the Baltimore Ravens end up thin at cornerback at some point or another. Marcus Peters, as we can see with J.K. Dobbins, no sure thing. J.K. Dobbins is a much younger player that doesn't maybe have quite as much wear and tear in some ways in his body and, and theoretically should be able to come back to the field faster. Peters still isn't here. Marlon Humphrey missing practice. Brandon Stevens missing practice. So, uh, Jalen Armour Davis missing some time. So hopefully it's all bumps, bruises, and soft, uh, you know, the, the the more of the soft tissue stuff or whatever, the callousing that John Harbaugh always refers to is more of the case, and that's what's going on. But at the end of the day, yes, they do need to bring on more corners. They ultimately always end up short, so bring them here faster. They bring in, you know, uh, Worley and, and are going to have more bodies, and the faster you get them here, the faster they'll get up to speed. And I think it's a, a, a forever evergreen statement that the Baltimore Ravens need more corners, and it was a good thing that they signed more. Yeah, it, feel, it feels like that statement. We say it at least like three times a year because it's just, you know, we talk about it in training camp, how they're so deep in the position, and then someone gets injured, then it's another, 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 and they have so much talent there. It's super unfortunate it happens, but it, it just has happened. And also, Spencer, the outside linebacker position, we've talked about that at length this offseason. And with the Ravens losing Vince Beagle, Stephen Means to return to practice, but they had that scare there where you know we didn't really know what was going on with that seems like everything's good but but at this point Spencer with Beagle on injured reserve you're hoping Ty Spouser gonna be ready for week one you don't know David Ajabo you know what's his timeline here so again it's back to the conversation of Adafi Owe Justin Houston and Dalen Hayes is your big three you have Jeremiah Moon Chuck Wiley but is this a position Spencer where they have to bring somebody else in because their depth is getting thin I certainly would think that Jason Pierre-Paul is still on the table and we haven't heard a ton out of Dalen Hayes as well, uh, which, which, you know, at this point doesn't bode well, but it's still early in camp. We still have all the preseason games left and and a lot more to go. So uh, again, better, better be on the safe side, get Jason Pierre-Paul in as quickly as possible. Why not? Uh, Depending on the money. Well, that could be the why not, but yeah, certainly bring someone else in. Uh, Beagle goes down. I think Malik Harrison's going to get an honest shot to rotate more into that room and play some more of, those roles and I'm curious to see what he can do with that but would would definitely be in favor of having a Jason Pierre-Paul as opposed to not in that case right and all right final question before we head into break would you rather trade at this point for a cornerback or an outside linebacker based off of everything that you know right now it's a tough question depends on who Uh, but if I'm shooting blindly I'm I'm gonna go with cornerback I think uh, coverage is paramount in this situation mike mcdonald was the the coach who was installing pressure packages in wake martindale's defense if you're not getting quite the production you need out of your outside linebackers i would rather be able to maybe try to manufacture pressure with a better cornerback 
that is still capable or still playing for that they acquire. So I'm going to go with corner at this point. I think that's the bigger pressing need. I just think that coverage is always more reliant and uh, consistent when you trade for it. You know what you're getting a little bit more so. So I would I would love to see them acquire a corner in this situation. Yeah, I think so too. I just think with the way that we saw the secondary collapse with injuries last year and just the guys they were playing, I think it is very important to have more than enough depth. It, obviously every position, but corner is one that I think the Ravens value a ton. I think that they would definitely give up something to get somebody in here. I know they were sniffing around Damian Howard last trade deadline, so they definitely were in that area. It'd be interesting to see what they end up doing there on the trade market. We'll head into our first break here, though, on Locked on Ravens. Coming up, we're going to be diving into the J.K. Dobbins return, the Justin Tucker extension, and more. So be sure to stay tuned. Still a ton to talk about here on the show. First, though, I do want to tell you a bit about Built Bar. And if you haven't tried the Built Bar Puffs yet, you're depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor in the delicious cookie. They're covered in chocolate. That's right. Built has done it again. And there's a new favorite flavor in town with a cookie dough chunk puff. They have a light and chewy texture. Real cookie dough chunks. And, of course, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. You have all the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it. Plus, it's healthy for you, cookie dough chunk puffs. Only 160 calories. They have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them as well. What's great about Built is that all their bars are made with proteins, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provide a ton of health benefits. You're going to love the new Keto Chunk Puff. Whether you need a snack for your workout or late night trade, you just need to grab a quick bite. Built is the perfect protein bar and they taste better than a candy bar. So go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15. Get 50% off your order, use promo code LOCK15. We're back. Our second segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Allstriker here with Spencer Schultz of Baltimore Beatdown. And Spencer, it was a a good day for the Ravens with J.K. Dobbins and with Justin Tucker. We'll start with J.K. Dobbins, the big story. Him getting activated off of the PUP list. He told Ian Rappaport to watch, and he certainly held up that end of the bargain as he returns to practice. Individual work, not a ton. He left practice around 3 p.m. So, you know, what wasn't a, a huge workload day, but to see him out on the uniform, you know, running out of that tunnel, high-fiving the kids, it, it was a sight to see. I mean, what, what's your excitement level here that he's now back? have to be very excited. It's it's the first of the, the major injuries from a year ago, late in camp and, and that running back room and many other injuries uh, of the, of the season-ending kind, of the knee guys and everything like that to return. So, you, you think that timeline hopefully holds true for Gus Edwards and Marcus Peters, which would put them about two, three weeks out. Obviously, everybody's different. Guys return at different paces, all those things. But good to see him return. Nonetheless, it is the first first phase out of the way in terms of him actually getting back on the field. Uh, the, the rehab is now in many ways behind him. And now it's going to be trying to stretch out, get back into football shape, open back up. Definitely doesn't look quite the same. But hey, it's his first day back in pads as a part of the actual team practice and going to be a lot of catching up to do. Is he ever going to be a hundred percent again in general? Probably not. He'll probably never be quite the same player. I think a lot of people that suffer those injuries have gone on the record many times before to say they were never the same, but they adjust, they can recover. They can play at a high level. Again, seeing guys like Adrian Peterson, low key be, be better than they were before in some ways, but then you also see the Odell Beckham's guys recover from it, come back on the field, still be very successful. You just have to adapt to your, new challenge and overcome it. And J.K. Dobbins seems to have the right attitude. I think Marlon Humphrey put it well. Ian Rappaport won the battle, but J.K. Dobbins won the war there. He is back in practice, well ahead, has 34 days to get ready for the New York Jets. And I I don't anticipate, you know, again, him being back to 100% and what that might entail. But amazing to see him back, the energy that he brings, and the hope that they will have another dynamic football player and a, a dynamic carrier of the football that can do things in the open field. Many people forget J.K. Dobbins led the NFL all running backs as a rookie in yards per carry, six yards per carry. I think he was one of three players uh, with over 50 carries as a, a running back to lead the NFL and or have at least six yards per carry as a rookie. I think he was like Jim Brown and Hers- Herschel Walker or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, he was incredible. He was dynamic. He forced broken and missed tackles at a really high rate. He had, I think, like the fifth highest breakaway percentage in other words what percent of your runs go for 15 yards all of those things so having someone back into the offense that can do things with the football in their hands regardless of handoffs regardless of if he's getting you know the ball thrown to him a little bit in space doing some of those things is very good news and hopefully means that Gus Edwards and Marcus Peters might be able to be back in in a similar timeline yeah and I don't know Spencer did you see the clips that were posted from the guys there at training camp and if you did how did he look and also a follow-up to that is what are you expecting from over over these first couple days couple weeks of practice as he as he gets more acclimated definitely looked like he had a little bit of a you know a tightness to him still probably still getting familiar with his body I don't think uh, we should be 
looking too deep into, into it today, but let's see what he looks like in 10 days then another 10 days after that. And then right before the season starts and then ultimately then. So it's going to be a process again, him just getting back on the field. He's definitely going to have to work with the way that knee now feels and the way his body now feels and figure out the, the fine details. He's going to be very sore here in the next couple of days in all likelihood, be able to recover a little bit, take it light, have a day off here or there and then change it up. So I think that at the end of the day, we're going to see him have to slowly increase his workload, work his way back. And uh, he, he was about 11 months out, which is a good timeline. Usually nine is too soon. 10 is, is starting to be there. 11 is a good threshold for football activity. Again, from what I've read from pro football doctor and all of those things, at least uh, people smarter than me. So hopefully able to see him continue to increase that workload over time, that practice load, find his way into full team here, some point in training camp or right before the season, have a couple you know, days or a week or two of that would be fantastic. And then it's it's going to be a definite management situation moving forward, even into the regular season. Yeah, and it's about just how you manage the snaps in the preseason, in the regular season. Now, preseason, why, Spencer, are you expecting him to play at all? I'm not expecting him to play. I think that he would, uh, based, on, based on his uh, kind of response after the injury occurred last year, I, I would be shocked if there's even a remote consideration of him ever playing in any preseason again, game again, unless it's, you know, him trying to make a roster if things go the other way some years from now or something like that. So I don't think we're going to see J.K. Dobbins in Baltimore play another preseason game in his career. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't think there's any way he plays in the preseason, but regular season wise, Spencer, what are you expecting early on from a workload perspective here? Are you expecting maybe 10 carries into 12 carries and into 14? How do you think the Ravens are going to manage the snaps in his workload early on? I definitely think he's going to be playing well below 50% of snaps to start. Um, maybe some more of those are touches as opposed to, you know, pass pro or things like that at first. So it might be a little bit of a tell when he's on the field that he's getting the ball more so at a higher rate uh, would, would be my, my best estimation. So I think we see him maybe around 30, 40% of snaps at the most week one, week two, uh, slowly want to see him start integrating back in. And then hopefully by, you know, November, December, he's a little bit more stretched out. They haven't put too much of a toll in the rest of his body. And he's able to, to feel a little better, you know, maybe coming out of the bye week or whenever at some point like that. But it's uh, going to be tough. You know, it's, he's not going to be 100 percent this whole year. So I think tempering expectations is not a bad practice. And if he blows them out of the water, then then we're happy either way. But to expect him to come back right now and go take a you know 70 percent workload, which would be high for a running back anyway, especially in this offense, and then go, you know, have 20 touches or something like that would, would almost be reckless. So. I don't think that's how he's going to come out week one, but you know, month by month, maybe we see that creep up 10, 15% usage from September to October. And then again, from October to November, something like that, hopefully to the point where he is able to be a, a heavy workload running back again. Uh, although, you know, not going to be the same case as it was in 2020 when he was healthy. Yeah. And we, we know the talent that he has. He, he showed it during his rookie season. The potential is all there, but speaking of talent, Spencer, the, the greatest kicker of all time to sign an extension, if you didn't know, and Mr. Justin Tucker himself signing a, a four year extension with this team. He had $24 million there, 17.5 guaranteed $11.5 million signing bonus. Were you expecting a Tucker extension anytime soon here? Uh, I think it was a little bit sneaky, but at the same time, seeing that Boswell, uh, the Ravens just love Justin Tucker so much. And is he the best kicker of all time? In my opinion, definitely. Most talented, definitely the most talented kicker over any sustained period of time. Clutch, 57 consecutive fourth quarter and overtime makes. Uh, you know, We know about the record. We know all those things. But at the same time, he's a part of the city of Baltimore. Uh, he is someone who represents their organization. He is on tons of commercials. Fans love him. I've have never seen as many kicker jerseys anywhere as I have of Justin Tucker. Maybe Adam Vinatieri at one point had a ton, but Justin Tucker is beloved in Baltimore. He represents his family well. He represents the Ravens well. He represents the organization as well as the city of Baltimore really well. And I think any time, any kicker, maybe a good strategy is, is to, you know, try and get the Ravens to, to play a game of cat and mouse. You know, the Steelers go give Chris Boswell a, a, a record-setting deal. Of course the Ravens are going to jump again, so... Uh, maybe it's maybe it's shoot yourself in the foot to get your opponent to shoot themselves in the foot to an extent, but um, he's the only one who's worth it in the end of the day. I'm, I'm not a huge kickers and punters guy in, in many ways. I do enjoy that aspect of the game, but in terms of paying them that amount of money, there's not a single kicker in the league that I'm paying anything close to what the Justin Tucker was paid, and I think he's well worth it. I don't think we can properly even measure his contributions 
in advanced metrics, formulas, you know, EPA, all of those things right now. I don't think we can quite measure the impact that he has on play calling, on confidence levels at different points, on, you know, how you might script something, able to navigate through some different situations because you know he is that good at the end of the half and especially at the end of the game or in overtime. He is going to go win the game. Uh, there's the GIF that's been going around for years. It's like a Madden GIF. I think it's like lightning striking, and it says, spoiler alert, Justin Tucker wins it at the end. It's like the most classic way of explaining his contract or anything related in Justin Tucker. Spoiler alert, Justin Tucker wins it at the end. He has done that so many times without failing. Uh, the, the, the one blemish ever was the, the Saints mixed extra point and the, the famous – uh, image of his eyeball is about to fall out of his head because he was in such utter disbelief. So he is the best. He deserved it. And he's going to be a Raven through 2027 and most likely for life. If he's able to keep playing at a, a high level through that, then it wouldn't be surprised at all. Yeah. And it's almost like that level of, of comfortability you had with Sam cook trotting out there. It's like, all right, so it's the Ravens have to punt the ball. You're going to get a solid punt. He'll pin him, whatnot with Justin Tucker. It's all right. So Justin Tucker's coming on the field to kick a field goal at extra point. It's more than likely going in. So he just has that consistency, the clutch, Dean Spencer. When you saw the money value, I mean, what was the reaction there? Did you think, oh, wow, that's a lot for a kicker? I think look, for Tucker, it's, it's absolutely worth it for what he's done for this team overall. Well, definitely, it's going to be more than any other kicker. And again, when there's another kicker that's making more than him, it, it just simply isn't right. So that amount makes sense. And it seems like there's some flexibility to it, I'm sure, and, and not going to be any sweat off of Tucker's back. But it honestly says a lot about the way they feel about him, not only as a player, but as a person and how much the Ravens really do focus on their special teams and excelling in that third aspect of the game that many don't focus on quite as much as they do. And what Tucker provides in that sense is all makes sense. It all just adds up ultimately. And considering the, nobody cares more about special teams than the Ravens and there's nobody better than Justin Tucker, 17 million fully guaranteed through 2027. Sounds about right. Yep, I am totally okay with it. Finally, Spencer, before we head into our final break, favorite Justin Tucker memory, what is it for you? Favorite Justin Tucker memory, I'm going to go with when Tucker, uh, in, in the famous Lamar locker room game, when, when Tucker comes back out and there's all this uncertainty and panic, but in that same moment, you know that he's going to go drain a 56-yard field goal. Um, that that one really stuck out to me. And then, you know, the, the classic answer is going to be the game winner against the the Lions either time, but I really did let the 66 yarder was great, but I was a bigger fan of the 61 yarder because that game was just all Tucker. It was his, his classic game. That was the game that really, I think was the first stamp on his kind of legacy aside from the Super Bowl, things like that. When, when he went and beat the Detroit Lions by nuking six balls perfectly down the middle, including that, that miraculous field goal to, to beat the Lions. So uh, the, the quote that came after this past one of, you know, I like Detroit a lot. Maybe I'll look into getting a house here with his new contract. Maybe he does. Yeah. Those, those two Detroit games. I mean, obviously the 66 yard, everybody talks about and that one. I thought the ball had bounced out. I thought it was, I thought it had bounced out and I was like, Oh, well good try. And then it, you see the net move and you're like, Oh my, like he did it. Like he made the field goal. But the other, the other game, a lot of people do forget about it. And that was a game that I think that I'm never going to forget. The one, the one that I I go back to though is is the rookie year double overtime Denver game. I mean that that game winning field goal might not have been like his best kick ever or anything, but like just that moment, partnered with the Mile High Miracle and everything that game was was just unbelievable. So to have a, a rookie kicker who had been so good that year anyway send him to the AFC Championship, obviously he played a big role in that playoff run, that Super Bowl run. That, that's the one that stands out to me above all else. But there, there are so many other memories, and we could sit here talking for like an hour about just Justin Tucker in general. We still have a ton to talk about here on the show, not related to Justin Tucker. We'll dive into the Ravens training camp practice on Monday. We'll talk about the preseason a little bit, Thursday preseason opener for the Ravens against Tennessee. So we should have stayed tuned, still have a ton to talk about here on the show. First, though, I do want to tell you a bit about Dave. And sometimes in life, hindsight can be 2020, and you can't change the past, obviously. But what if you could get a little help from your future self? Maybe you'd ask to borrow a little cash, and now you can actually do that with Dave. Dave is the banking app that can help you get up to $500 instantly with extra cash. That means there's more money to fill your tank, buy a wedding gift, or even catch up on bills. You're going to finally tackle those expenses that have been stressing you out without any hangups. There's no interest, no credit card check needed. And millions of people have already downloaded the Dave app to get the financial relief they need with extra cash. So if you're in a pinch and need some extra help, down Download Dave and they give it as a helping hand from future you. Download the Dave app from the App Store right now. That's D-A-V. You can sign up for an extra cash account and get to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. It's a service supply. Thank you provided by Evolve member FTIC. The future you will thank you. 
We're back here, our final segment of Locked on Ravens. Kevin Oshak is still here with Spencer Schultz. And Spencer, the Ravens got another training camp practice under their belt on Monday. And I just want to talk to you about a couple of things that happened there. I think one of the standouts we, we heard was Kyle Hamilton. Hamilton had an interception. And his training camp, for a lot of people, has been all over the place. For me, I don't. I mean, I think it's been pretty good based off of everything that's come out. I think the Bailey Gate, the rep, has kind of gotten everybody tied up a little bit in that one rep when that drill, again, is not favored towards the defense whatsoever. But, I mean, h- how happy are you to, one, hear that he got his first interception at training camp? And what has your overall impression of him been so far based off what you heard? Definitely like to see him trying new things. Uh, a lot of, a lot of you know, micro, putting a microscope over what he's doing, but it looks like he's doing things that – he wasn't doing in college. He's playing bail technique. In other words, lining up in press right before the snap, bailing back five, seven yards and trying to kind of be reactionary at the stem, get his hands on a receiver, things like that. Understanding what hands to shoot in order to force a receiver a certain direction and also not lock your hips. If you shoot your right hand, it's going to lock your hips a certain way. So instead you might need to shoot your left hand to open the receiver where you want them to go. Things like that. Training camp is for training. Training camp is not for winning every single rep every single time, doing all of the things that you're great at nonstop and never working on anything that is new or, or any sort of tweaks or anything like that. So the Ravens want him to work hard to be a complete player. He was drafted with the you know, 14th overall pick in the draft. He's one of the highest drafted Ravens in a long time. So throw you know the kitchen sink at him. I love it. I love to see him competing. I love to see him getting beaten. I love to see him making plays at the same time. So Kyle Hamilton's going to need to, to be able to have a little bit more versatility within man coverage. So he's going to lose reps. He wasn't polished at that coming out of Notre Dame. He wasn't drafted to do that, but he's probably going to learn that skill over the next year, two years, three years. Are the Ravens going to go play the New York Jets and ask him to go cover Elijah Moore in press in the slot? No, they're absolutely not. Are they going to stick him on an island against you know Corey Davis? No, they're not. But he needs to work on those things. So all of that's always taken in context. We can you know, tweet out a, a single video, a single clip to, to prove a point or confirm a bias or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, I'm glad to see him trying some new things, it looks like. I'm glad that that's the Ravens coaching staff's approach with him. He was very polished at playing some deep center. He was very polished coming down into the box. He's pretty polished against tight ends. You know, Him and Isaiah likely having some battles. You love to see it. Him and Mark Andrews having some battles. All of those things. So... I think it's it's going to be a growing process, a learning process. He was one of the younger players drafted in the first round. Uh, but, you know, he also came to OTA's uh, mini camp, and his, I think the first play was a pick. His first play at Notre Dame was a pick six when he was a, a true freshman coming in. So I, I think what we're seeing in training camp is not what is the short-term plan for Kyle Hamilton. And I think that when he goes and steps in in week one, the role that they're going to have for him, much like Brandon Stevens in ways, who was not nearly as polished coming out, is going to be defined. It's going to be playing to his strengths. And I think we're going to see a really good football player almost off the bat. Maybe not week one, but decent enough. And then I think he's going to turn in a really good performance this year within a defense that has two really smart safeties, a ton of DB experience. Uh, good coaching staff around him, a lot of veterans on that defense. So I think we're going to see a Kyle Hamilton come out and be a, a real weapon X for the Ravens. Yeah, and you make a great point about, you know, training camp is for training. You don't want to put Kyle Hamilton in these situations in, in the fourth quarter against the Steelers in, in a big clutch situation. You want to figure out, all right, what can he do here right now? What can he improve on? How can we teach that? You want to do that in August. You don't want to do it in January. And I think that's exactly right there. And, and you mentioned Isaiah Likely there. Hamilton got the better of Likely yesterday. But we've seen those guys battle back and forth, the iron sharpens iron mentality. But Spencer, I do want to talk about those pass catches a little bit because it, it was a a pretty good day for the wide receivers overall. You had Devin Duvernay catching a touchdown. Jalen Moore blew past Robert Jackson, but then he lost track of the ball. Slade Bolden had a wild catch, and that was something that I know a friend of the show, Kyle Barber, and obviously knew, you know Kyle Spencer. So Kyle ends up tweeting out these updates that are really great. You also have James Prochet beating Kyle Fuller twice, including for a 40-yard touchdown. So what's your overall implication of this wide receiver room right now, and who's your favorite at the moment for number five? For number five, I really like the sound of Benjamin Victor. I like the sound of, of a outside body that's been here a couple years now and shows really outstanding body control, has definitely made some plays. I think that he is of what they have to choose from, what they can't afford to let get away, more so than maybe a Slade Bolden. When you do have a James Prochet that's showing out in camp and is going to be able to go play in the slot, maybe a little bit outside and make plays, be that you know nice presence over the middle of the field and in the short and intermediate game a little bit more so. 
I think that that's ultimately going to end up helping you more. So Benjamin Victor is definitely the one that I think is continue to make plays pretty consistently. They've kept him around for a while for a reason. And somebody that feels like kind of just gels into the room really well uh, seems to, to really chop it up. So I think that he's been here long enough. There's going to be a little bit higher level trust. And I think we're going to go see him make plays again in the preseason. We saw him make quite a few last year. They kept him on the practice squad. He hung around. The, the receiver room had two veterans in Marquise Brown and Sammy Watkins. So a much thinner room this time around. And I think he's the one that they keep. Yeah, and the good thing about this too is regardless of who does make that number five or even if they keep six, number six, is unless a team claims them off of waivers or they go somewhere else, they can put maybe two or three of these guys on the practice squad that they really, really like that maybe made some plays. And then if there is an injury or two, they have to call up somebody else. They have options who have been in their system, who impressed in training camp and hopefully here the preseason. And that's a really good thing to have. But speaking of the preseason, Spencer, again, that first game coming up here on Thursday against Tennessee, who are you looking at? Who are you looking at to hopefully show you some things? Who might you want to see a little bit more of that you haven't heard a ton of in training camp so far? Where are you looking? Well, I'm certainly going to be keyed in on the big boys, Travis Jones, Daniel Falele. Really curious to see how they handle themselves. Falele is being looked at as someone that they don't hopefully don't need this year. So I'm curious to see where he's at, where his development is for sure. Travis Jones, on the other hand, I think is an X factor on this team where if he can come in and, uh, Kind of be somewhat similar to maybe a Christian Wilkins in ways. He's a little bit, a little bit more of an inside player, probably a little bit more of a nose tackle, but kind of a similar skill set in many ways. I think he has that potential to be somewhere in that stratosphere of a Christian of a Wilkins down in Miami. So really curious to see him, you know, go out class depth quickly. I think he's probably going to get a ton of snaps this week. And really curious to see how he responds. His hand's so heavy. You hear the words Michael Pierce says about him, how often he's getting his hands and deflecting balls and all of those kinds of things. So he's one I'm super curious about. I want to see Christian Welch and Zacoby McLean in that middle linebacker room. Welch ended up getting on the field defensively quite a bit. Malik Harrison obviously had an off-the-field incident you know, at a party, very luckily walked away with his life last year. And so I'm curious to see him able to, to – bounce back and and you know he's spoken about having a second lease on life and his career and how much more seriously he wants to take it uh, all of those things someone that i think is ultra talented that i had a borderline first round grade on coming out of ohio state and had some ups some downs and, and some really good plays as a rookie and then kind of ended up in a weird role but so kobe mclean is is one that i think has a really good shot to make this team for sure um he's by all intents and purposes, you know, had had a couple nice plays throughout camp all of those things finally dalen hayes on the defensive side of the football Where's he been? We haven't heard much about him. Made some really nice plays last preseason. Had a filthy uh, ghost and dip dip and rip move against the, the Saints. Uh, ghosted the edge and able to go get a quarterback hit on, on Jameis Winston. I think ended up resulting in a sack. Obviously, injury woes kind of kept him out. So, very curious on him. On the offensive side of the football, again, Daniel Falele, Ben Cleveland going to get a ton of time here. We're going to get to see Isaiah Likely, obviously. And I think he's kind of going to be the big ticket item offensively. As well as Tyler Beatty. So, really those rookies that they drafted in that sense. And then other than that, it's it's who's going to go make plays as a wide receiver. You're going to get tons of snaps. Uh, there's so much to go take. You know, James Prochet really probably doesn't have much to prove in preseason. I kind of would prefer to see him not play a ton. Devin Duvernay, been on the field a ton, doesn't need to play in this game. But Jalen Moore, Shamar Bridges, Makai Polk, you know, Bailey Gaither, Devin Williams, Benjamin Victor, all these guys, Slade Bolden, all these guys have so much of a chance to go make plays. I think Tylen Wallace, we will probably see a little bit more of someone who didn't get a ton of snaps offensively. So uh, those are the guys I'll all really be looking for in this game. Of course, you want to go see Pepe Williams as well defensively, but I feel like I feel like Pepe Williams is ready to rock and roll. It seems like he's got the confidence about him. I think he's going to be a solid player and he's going to fit into this defense well. So all the young guns, that's where I'm going to be looking, and hopefully we're able to see the uh, the, the defense show out and, and see some big uglies, some pass catchers go do well and all of those things. So who's going to emerge in the pass catching group? Is Ben Cleveland or Daniel Falele looking like a, a real polished product? And then can those young guys defensively go play consistently and prove to be athletically superior in general, uh, playing a little faster, playing a little stronger, playing a little smarter? So that's what I'll have my eyes on this week. Yeah, and just to add, you, you mentioned a lot of guys that I have my eye on too, but I think that left guard competition, you mentioned Ben Cleveland. I'm interested to see Tyree Phillips, Ben Powers, how those guys end up playing. Isaiah Likely, I mean, how does this team line him up all over the field and kind of figure out what his roles slash roles can be on the field in 2022? And then also on defense, I'm looking at those undrafted outside linebackers, Chuck Wiley, Jeremiah Moon, two guys who I think, again, 
have a path to a roster spot, depending on what the health of Tyus Bowser is, David Ajabo, et cetera. But I think we could definitely see one of those two, maybe both, but more likely by one of the two, make the roster. And then also Geno Stone, someone who, you know, I had in a battle with Darius Washington. Washington's still on the PUP list. I don't really know what the situation is with him right now. Maybe they stash him for a year. I'm not sure. But Geno Stone is someone who I don't think, you know, like right now he's a definite lock on my roster, but just to see how he, he improves during his third year in this league. I know that also Patrick Queen, Malik Harrison, you, you talked about. I think that these guys, this inside linebacker position, we're going to see a lot out of them and, and kind of figuring out how many can they keep. Are they going to keep four and maybe keep more safeties? Are they going to go with five or six? I don't know, but I think the, that's another position to definitely look out for sure. But Spencer, I appreciate you hopping on with me. Very busy Monday yesterday. I appreciate you hopping on here, talking with me about everything. What do you have going on as the preseason kicks off here? Well, article is always pumping on BaltimoreBeatdown.com. We're going to be breaking down some tape finally, getting into this first preseason game. Football is back enough to the point where we're going to be able to cut into it, dive down, and break down some full performances of some young players. So Isaiah Likely, Zacoby McLean, Pepe Williams, you know, Odafe Owe probably going to go play a little bit, I would expect, just to go sh- show what he can do just a touch. Uh, the, also, you know, hey, let's see, let's see how this Ravens preseason streak goes. They do have the NFL record right now for consecutive wins. Feels like they're probably changing their course in that sense a little bit in terms of health. But I'm gonna be breaking all of that down on BaltimoreBeatdown.com, the Baltimore Beatdown podcast. You can find it wherever you get your podcast, as well as on Twitter at Ravens for Dummies. Thank you so much, everyone, and make sure to go give five stars to the man who gives you the best daily Ravens coverage, Locked On Ravens, and Kevin Ostriker. Thanks, Kevin. I'll talk to you guys next week. I appreciate you as always, Spencer. And yeah, maybe, the, you know, the Ravens got the preseason record. They say, all right, we got it. Let's uh, let's kind of turn it down a little bit injury-wise and get the, get the young guys in there. But hey, these young guys can go out there. They can win games themselves. So we'll see what ends up happening there. But thank you again, Spencer. And again, Spencer's work will be in the description below on YouTube. Be sure to check it all out. But that's all I have for you here today on Lockdown Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. When we get back here tomorrow, I'll be rounding out another episode talking about more Ravens talk. So be sure to stay tuned for that. And I will see you here tomorrow.